Thanks, Tibby. Um, now, I, when Tibby asked me for the session, I kind of said, look, I don't want it to be me talking for an hour and a half and you just guys just listen because I, I really, I neither like it nor do I think we get the most out of it. So it's really kind of, it's more a conversation. I really want to hear from you. I want to hear your questions, you know, your inputs, that sort of thing. So um, you all would have received a link to a document. It's a live document. Uh, and the idea is to keep that then document for future or, you know, we can expand it, work around it and that sort of thing. But it's, it's, that, that's where the questions would go. That's the, the conversations, would be, if, you, if you like, would be framed around those questions. Um, I also did those questions kind of, there is a bit of deliberate flaw on my part because this is kind of the key questions that my book, I'm not here to promote the book, but yes, I've written the book, but, but these are the questions that my book actually revolves around. And my book is actually, okay, let's get that out of the way. I wrote, it's called The Love of Goalkeeping, Many Sports, One Love. And it's actually not about goalkeeping in just water polo but he talks about the key question is what is common to goalkeepers across any sport with a goalkeeper? Because um, I played handball goals before and I stood in futsal goals and I stood in soccer goals and I started working with soccer goalkeepers a little bit and Toby, our youngest, is a soccer goalkeeper. And then I and I was, then I was invited to this camp in Canberra and was a little, half of my stuff there was sort of soccer goalkeeper stuff. And, they, they, you know, people really loved it. And I thought, there's something in it, you know. So it's something I've been thinking about for 20, 30 years. It's been in my head. So I finally actually got together. Um, and I spoke with many, many people from different sports. And it's amazing how similar, really, the role is of goalkeeper in different sports. Um, so basically that's what the book is about. So it's not specifically about water polo, but water polo players and coaches and goalkeepers can easily find themselves in the book. Okay. Um, it's not out yet. I'm looking for a publisher. So if you know one, but, um, uh, cause I suck at self promotion. I don't like this, but that's all I'm going to talk about the book. Okay. So that, that, that's that. Um, so the questions, um, this is what the people so far have contributed about, about the question. Like, um, and I think it really, it might look strange that, that, that first question, I'm not sure if you, Tibby, if you, I'm not sure if you've seen the document, if you go, oh, you can see it on screen. Yeah, I huh? shared the um, document, so you've got all the questions Important. and some of the answers there. The role of a goalkeeper. Thanks, Thanks How important is the role of goalkeeper? How continues to change? Um, and this is especially for water polo now with the rule changes. It's a massive change. It's gone from, you know, even historically, it's gone from the, you know, the, the lone shot stopper to something that's like a director of a general just in defense and now participate in attacks. So you have to, it's got, you have to be a multi-skilled athlete these days. And you look at the Olympics when you can, you know, when you're going to have 11 people or 12 or whatever it's going to be, you know, it's, you, you goalkeepers, it's absolutely essential. Not that it wasn't before, but now it's even more. And you look at any other team that's kind of any, serious, any chances of any success that they, you know, without a goalkeeper, you haven't got it. You haven't got a chance especially the elite level, you haven't got a chance with a, with a, without a solid goalkeeper. Strangely though, you know, people still don't work with goalkeepers and we'll get to that. But what I kind of teased out a little bit and I have really thought about it, it's really important for, uh, especially kids, um, to recognize that a goalkeeper is actually, it's not just a, um, it's not just a playing position. It's actually part of identity of who you are. And the reason we kind of, kind of labor that point a little bit is because the level of care that you have about what you do goes up when, you ident when kids start to identify as a goalkeeper. 
it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And I've talked to people on the sport and it's exactly the same water polo. When you feel like you belong to that space and go, that's yours, that that is what you want to do. It's, you know, it's, that's, that's when you, um, that's when the kids get hooked in. Um, now, in terms of working with goalkeepers, what that means is if that's an important part of a person's, uh, person's identity, the person you're working with who comes down to the pool, you know, five times a week, if that's an important part of their identity, then you not working with the goalkeepers in a way you're saying, I don't care about you. I don't, I don't care about who you are. Okay. I don't acknowledge you as a, you know, as, as who you are. So I know at times it sounds a bit esoteric and, and academic, but, but I've seen it so many times, um, especially, especially with young kids. So um, it's an important kind of aspect of it to, to kind of acknowledge it first and get the kids to identify as goalkeepers. Yeah. And, but having said that, a goalkeeper is an essential part of a team, not, oh, I'm so special, I'm a goalkeeper, that sort of thing. No, I don't buy that. Okay. Uh, you guys, any comments on that? Have you ever seen that? Am I up the right track here? I'm, 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 I'm asking you guys. I don't think I don't think you've ever seen I don't think you've seen some goalkeepers that are are like that and have that attitude. I actually like what you said before that you know the goalkeeper in the goals you know they feel as though they belong, and I think part of it is that that they feel that defence is an attitude that it's mm. the you know they're not the last line. I mean you mentioned it before the sole the sole blocker or the sole defender or whatever it might be, but yeah, yeah. it's they they have that defensive attitude that mm. nothing can get past them and, and you know playing with you on the team it was you know you got screamed and yelled at because you weren't doing I wasn't doing my job or the yeah. other defenders weren't doing their job yeah. which didn't help you do yours and you know yeah. we sometimes don't have that defensive minded attitude as a field player that, that you did um, mm. you know I think I think you know <laughs> You know, looking looking on it now, uh, you know, I th certainly think that a goalkeeper you know, is probably one of the most important players in the team. I mean, mm. Mm. I, the, if if you have a good one, you're going to win, or you'll you'll mm -hmm. succeed more than you more than you don't. Mm -hmm. And um, mm. I'm not going to jump into some of the other areas you want to talk about, but um, yeah. you know, I think that yeah, sure we'll mention it. Yeah. I also like to add that um, when I, um, uh, you know, in competitions, watching them managing or even playing, sometimes you see in teams where the team itself wasn't actually very strong on the field, uh, but they were successful purely because they had a very uh, charismatic leader at the back uh, in the goal mm. Who, mm. who gave that leadership and that confidence mm. to the team. It really mm. can, you know, lodge a team to, to go and do good things if the defence is solid. And we always say, if the defence works out well in the attack, it will come. Uh, mm. And it's unfortunately true for the opposite, that the more you mm. screw mm. up in defence, unfortunately, uh, it happens to be well, impacting it's... on the attack. So goalies, major role. But it's something... Yeah, but it's something I, I, I kind of thought about and I mentioned in the book as well. It's... It's not to have that, you know, view, a negative view of goalkeeping. A goalkeeper is just here to save our ass. But, but rather than that, then asking what does having this goalie, hopefully a good one, <laughs> allow us to actually do, okay? Or sort of, you know, you have a goalie we can play both zone and press or drop, whatever you want, you know, you'll be fine. Or you have a goalie who's good distributing or, we, you know, that sort of thing. So... So right from the outset, if you ask those questions, you are connected to the idea of identity. You are, you're positioning goalkeeper as the builder of a team, not just, the, you know, he's the one who's going to cover for our mistakes sort of thing. Yeah? Yeah. 
and that and, and that's a bit of a mindset. And as Paula said, it's a, it's a bit of a defensive mindset, absolutely. But more and more, we got bloody involved in it as well. And it's fascinating that role has actually changed. I did a bit of history for the book, um, from the old rules to, to now in different sports. It's, it's a fascinating history. And um, in water polo, actually, the first goal was on the shore. So the goalkeeper was able to charge them the head. To run along the shore and jump on the defender's head. I go, Ooh, I'm sure there'll be a few goalies loving that now. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so, yeah, second to that, the, the second question, what does being a goalkeeper mean? Um, and this is, comes up not just out of personal experience, but experience of many people I spoke to. It's, it's that you are you know, that last line, you are an individual the team, you are being the most important defender who can see the whole field from the best position defence. Absolutely, whoever wrote that, you know, true. But it's really important to acknowledge um, but not overstate the, the speciality of goalkeeping um, because you don't want to get... I, I, I'll be the first one to hate seeing goalkeepers as somehow seeing themselves special. They just have a different job. Yeah? Um, if, 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 if that makes sense. Yeah. They are important, but they are a part of the team. Okay? But they are different to the part of the team. They're an important, but a different part of the team. Okay? So, that's something that... I reckon even from little juniors to the Olympic level, that, that, that has to be present because out of that comes that, we're going to talk about it a bit later, comes that presence, that responsibility that you take on as a goalkeeper. And you go, right, I'm here to, you know, scare the shit out of the opposition, support my teammates and, you know. And if you feel like that, all your calls, all your yelling and directing defence actually has weight. Yeah rather than just kind of, yeah, whatever. You're just another, just, just another person there. Um, so once again, acknowledging this, the not so, maybe specialness is not the right word, but difference of goalkeepers to, to the rest of, to, to the rest of the players. And, and, they, and they're kind of essentialness to, to, to the whole thing. Now, question three, this is the one that I kind of got a lot of questions about as well, always get the fundamentals of goalkeepers movement. It's funny how we don't, we just assume that the goalkeepers will just pick this up. And there's some sort of axioms of movement, like, you know, the short corners coming out, that sort of thing, that, that we just... We never kind of sit down with goalkeepers, and it might take ten minutes with, with a little, you know, um, with a little uh, whiteboard and a little, you know, a couple of magnets to explain the reach and the angles and all that. We just assume that the goalies will pick it up. Well, they do mostly, but if you do that earlier on, they get it really early on, and they, every movement they do afterwards. It has the point. There's a point to it. They understand why you cover the short corner. You know, when we yell out short corner, why you come out and why you, you know. I think it's maybe I'm, I'm banging up the wrong tree myself here. I'm I say by no means perfect, but I, I I believe when you explain to people why they're doing why you ask them to do a certain thing, they're far more likely to understand and, and, and actually do it properly as well. Um, so that uh, positioning to the ball, as you say in the document, um, standing on firm foundation and strong bit and explosive, um, especially with shots, I'm referring to the document now to to whoever wrote that. Absolutely, in modern water polo, I watch these old games, 
a water polo that I see on Facebook, you know, 1976 Olympics and that sort of thing. My God, they had all the time in the world, those goalkeepers. Not so, you look at the modern game, bloody hell, I, I wouldn't survive in the modern game. You know, the shooters are far more sophisticated, the shots are faster, there's, there's you know, the rules have changed with, you know, five meter shots and all the rest. It's just amazing what they have to go. So unless you have a firm foundation of that, of that, uh, you know, strong basic position from which you can move in any direction because that's the basis of agility um, is you're, you're gone. And one thing I found really, um, really useful and similar again across all sports is understanding the concept of center of gravity. It's fascinating how an ice hockey, the soccer, uh, ice hockey coach, a soccer coach and a water polo coach thought exactly the same about center of gravity. Yeah. Cause that's, if you think center of gravity is like the imaginary sort of top of the pin on which you can put the goalkeeper that can go in any direction, the easiest way. So that's just center of gravity. And for goalkeepers to understand that moving that basically, that's what's going to get you to the ball. Yeah. Um, and of course, in water polo, there's a trade-off. Um, and the water polo is pretty specific in that, actually. If you put your trunk a little bit too much for, far forward, so your, your center of gravity is way too forward, yeah, it gives you the extra kind of extension with the trunk and so you can reach the ball and the long shot and all the rest of it, which, which you have to do. But it's a trade-off in movement laterally. And, I mean, I don't have the time now, but... You know, in a training session, if you if you get the kids, especially kids, to understand and muck around with, okay, think, where's my center of gravity now? And how do I get it into position where I'm most likely to stop the next shot? Yeah? And then let them work it out themselves. Yeah? And they will get it. They, they will understand it. Yeah. So, um I found that a really useful and, and pretty universal kind of concept to stand to work with goalkeepers, the center of gravity. And, uh, and the longer moves you make, the longer and the heavier the moves, the more wrong-footed, the, 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 the higher the chances of you being wrong-footed of your center of gravity being somewhere where you don't want it to be. Yeah? So that's why I'll be, you know, a little like soccer goalkeepers who have little light feet and we don't encourage goalkeepers to kind of, to, we encourage them to glide across the goals, not, you know, jump across the goals, you know, and sink and all the rest of it. So that's all to do with, with center of gravity. Yeah, so I invite you to kind of have a think about it and have a bit of a play with it. Yeah. Any questions on that? I'm only finding myself talking too much. Any questions on that? Thoughts, observations, insights? Uh, my observation is uh, I always say to all my teams that the goalkeeper mm. is, uh, is always the most difficult position of the most mm. uh, difficult sport in the world. Mm. So I really think that as you say, Thomas is a, is a part of the team, but the goalkeeper is a, has skills that probably not in the same way no one else can have in, uh, during a game. Mm. Uh, mm. That's the reason why it's my personal consideration is that to build a goalkeeper, first step is uh, find, uh, since they are kids uh, who want to be a goalkeeper. So the question is yeah. important, who want to be in the goal? Because I wouldn't be a goalkeeper. I always thought that was not for me. So absolutely <laughs> was not my case. But it's mm. interesting uh, since the young age, uh, between uh, 10, 12, he who's mm. really find the passion. Because as also Paul said, it's an attitude. Defending is an attitude. Yeah, and, it is. Uh, and, and that's really why I think also that the goalkeeper Keeper must start pretty young. So there are different theories about. I will listen to what's your 
opinion mm. about it, but I think that a goalkeeper must be recognized very young in some way. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I'll, I'll skip these questions a little bit. I'll, I'll scroll down to the almost the second last one in the, how, how do you find a goalkeeper? I think it's question 12. Uh, and I uh, always tell this story, and if you get the book, you read it. Uh, you guys would know who Vlaho Orlic was, yeah? Uh, maybe you don't know, but he's the guy who basically created Rudic and and all these. He created them. Okay, he made them possible. He everything Rudic knows, he he he, he learned from this guy. Okay, anyway, um, and when he heard that I will be coaching juniors, this is before I migrated to Australia. We this. Uh, met in the cafe and split. Oh, how are you? I don't know. So you're going to Australia. Huh? So I'll be coaching juniors. And he says, so, he says, Thomas, what, what's your most important job with juniors? Yeah? And I go on about, you know, how you know, basic position and legs and this. And he kind of just kind of cut me off mid-sentence. He says, okay, no, that's important. But he says, your most important job as their coach, he says, is to get them to fall in love with the game. Everything after that is easy. Yeah? So I treat it like their girlfriend, yeah. So, <laughs> and it's and it's a similar thing with with the goalkeepers, yeah. But if you're going to get someone to, to fall, you know fall in love with something, boy, well, you're going to make it attractive, yeah. Um, you don't just leave it to kind of the happy accidents. Uh, you don't just kind of hope, you know, cross your finger. Hope is not a strategy, okay. Uh, hope is an option, but it's not a strategy, yeah that one of the kids will want to go in goals, okay? You have to make it attractive a little bit to them. And it's just, you know, uh, uh, perhaps rotate everyone evenly if there's no kind of volunteers. And I'm sure there's, they, look, I'm sure these are the sort of things that you do anyway. So I might be, I don't want to, you know, tell you the obvious. But rotating players, everyone has equal time. Um, uh, I've seen in some sports what they do, they count goalkeeper saves like they count goals. Yeah? So the goalie gets to be the hero of the team because they made, you know, the team only scored two goals, but they but they made five saves and, you know, team wins. So goalie is a hero, yeah? So kids want to be the hero, yeah? Um, they give them a little special gear and they look after them a little bit. And often it doesn't, it really doesn't take much, especially with younger kids. They don't, they don't want or probably need some sort of highly specialized technique, you know, but they have to like it. Yeah. And when you like something, you know, you and I, you know, if we like something, then we'll invest in it. Yeah. Um, and this is where, um, uh, one of many ways to kind of encourage those happy accidents. So when you see a kid that is keen, okay, just nurture it. You don't have to, uh, d d depending on the kid, you have to kind of read the kid a little bit. Kind of if, you, if you make a big deal out of it, big fuss about it, when the kids are 11, you might actually scare some kids. Go, oh my God, they have all this responsibility. Oh, I'm not doing it. Oh, yeah, so you have to kind of read the play a little bit. But generally, Make it attractive. What are the ways that that, car, that kid might fall in love with the goalkeeping? And have a look at, you know, and the things to look for when you are trying to get a goalkeeper is, you know, apart from obviously the, um, apart from obviously uh, physical predispositions, okay, you, you know, you, you look at, have a, have a look at, his, you know, his or her parents. Are they tall? You know, tall is an advantage in goalkeeping, yeah? Uh, and maybe, they may be short, but you see the parents are tall. So you're thinking, oh, just you wait, sunshine. That's okay. <laughs> you will grow. Um, but if you look for a kid who can, who can hold focus, who is not afraid, um, either physically or psychologically, um, who has a little bit of not fake but genuine, he doesn't have to be brush, 
brash, you know, oh, show off and all that. They're usually insecure, but kind of believe in themselves, yeah? Um, if they're coachable, um, if they're willing to improve, and it's kind of it's kind of the same as field players, really, no different to this point, apart from physical predispositions. But one thing is in goalies, and if you can see the sort of presence in goals, if they, if you see it, and the kids, they just love the space between the sticks. Yeah, you look for that, and if the kid likes that, if they like, not necessarily stopping every shot, but just like, you know, as Paulie said, that defensive mi mindset and all that, it just, that is gold. And you don't have to jump on it because goalkeepers take a while to, I wouldn't specialize too early and, you know, there, there's reasons for and reasons against, but, but just, just, um, just notice it. And when you notice it, um, don't let it go and just assume that the kid will be just uh, like that for the rest of their career. No, just encourage gently. Sometimes they might just need a little bit of reminder or some, sometimes pulling aside or a senior goalkeeper has a little chat with them. I still to the day remember this guy who was the first goalkeeper in the, in the, in the team. He came and watched me and watch one of my sessions because my coach kind of secretly asked him, can you watch this kid in a session? He's really going to make his day. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that was it. There was two beers in it probably. Yeah. And, oh God, he's watching me. Oh, we're talking second Yugoslav division, you know? And I just thought, my God, I remember coming home and telling people, oh, do you know who watched me to watch my session today? Oh, da, 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 da. You know, I remember these things. I was 11 years old. Yeah. So you don't have to go to technical, you know, pull the heart before you pull the hands and, you know, put the leg in position and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm making sense. I'm right. <laughs> okay. That was a very long answer to your questions, Ralph. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. I, uh, Thomas, I... Um, can I add a little bit on that? Because I totally agree with your story. Um, yeah. Uh, how goalkeepers just... Um, how goalkeepers usually identify themselves. Um, mm. And uh, I, I, I would like to add that um, usually they, they um, fall in love being a goalkeeper because they've been introduced by uh, some role model. Um, mm. Most of the mm. kids that become goalkeepers, they usually had a contact with someone who is a good goalkeeper and mm. they had a contact with someone that, you know, they watched someone saving all the balls, having good fun saving all the balls. Mm. Um, and, uh, That's important. In, in a lot of occasions, like in a lot of situations, they, they actually say like, oh, I would like to give up. And uh, even uh, like I do a bit of a, like a voluntary work with juniors. And I, sometimes I, I, myself, I jump in a pool and um, I actually introduce to the kids that, you know, you can save almost every ball. And um, mm. after that, I, I always have a positive feedback and always have three or four kids putting their hands up, um, willing to, to give a go and try and, you know, see how we go. Usually they get intimidated, but um, in Australia here, we... We don't have a small goals for juniors and uh, usually kids have to get into big goal where they're not going to reach. They the don't have a chance. <laughs> they're gonna, yeah. they, they struggle a lot and that's really yeah. hard. Like it, it's a hard work for them and they get discouraged. Yeah. But um, I think if, if you introduce them to a, a good role model, take them to yeah. a national league game and show this is a goalie and as you said, uh, let someone, some good goalie, come to the session and watch and have a talk and, you know, like introduce that, that um, position to them a bit more. I think I mm. can end up as a positive out, outcome. Mm. And, and, and the role models are really, really important. Um, it's, I, it's something that we, that we sorely kind of lack. It's something I've, I've really noticed is one of the things that's really lacking a little bit here. It's not that we don't have them. 
I think we have some fantastic goalkeepers around the place. And, you know, you don't have to be the world's best goalkeeper to be a good role model, you know. Um, but we kind of, I don't know, maybe we're forgetting that bit a little bit. We're just not paying attention to it. And, you know. Um, yeah. Nikola, and Nikola Kuljača. It doesn't take much. Yeah. Nikola Kuljača was mine. And he was never a good goalkeeper. He was always a second goalkeeper. First to Shoshtar, then to uh, Danny Shefix. He was always a second goalkeeper. Um, yeah. But that charisma that he was carrying, he actually, he actually was a motivation to a lot of goalkeepers in my generation and around my generation, just, you know, to a lot of kids to become goalkeepers. Yeah. And we were really yeah. lucky to have someone like him as a role model. And I think that's really important, um, something that mm. we, we all have to look in uh, here as in Australia, as in like introducing mm. the role models to, to our kids and our clubs to encourage more mm. kids to... to to um, get, yeah. you know, get between the, the, the posts. And you're right, Marco. You know when you said, um, I, I nodded when you said, um, we well, can see them having fun in goals. You know? You can see them, you know, punching the air. Hey, that sort of thing. I mean, that, that's fun. You know, it's, it's, and it doesn't really, doesn't take much to, for the kids to go, oh, we're done. Yeah, that's all. Give this a go. Yeah. Um, and and it's good, and they're not. And this is something I kind of try to pull apart a little bit. In the, the, there's idols that are kind of remote, and you know you only see them on television, and uh, they're way above their play Olympics. But and they're important. They're a bit like a dream, you know. Like uh, a dream is something you're not exactly in control of, but it's good to have. Yeah, you aspire to something. Yeah, I want to be like you know Shostad or something like that. Yeah. But, but the role models, the ones that, w- that, might, that might be a chance to see your training session, to have a chat with you, to you see them every day getting in, and you can, that's important. That's important. And we've got some really good goalkeepers around the place, you know, the young goalkeepers and all that, and, you know, make them aware of they are actually role models to, these, to, 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 to the kids in the club. Anyway, anyone had a view on that? Anyone else? Are we doing this now or should we do more of it? Or? <laughs> any, any goalkeepers in the house who want to wanna add to it or ask questions? We have a few. Mm. All right. So what Okay, you, Tibby, you, you, you pick a question. Well, we've done a few okay. now, you know. So, uh, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but that's okay, yeah. Oh, that's fine. I it's, think it, um, it's, it's a conversation, the, it's not a presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and one of the question and, and, and sort of uh, answer was also uh, prompting us to jump. So that's fine. Um, that's fine. But um, what do goalkeepers do to read the game to be in the right place in the right time? That would be question ah. four which ah. would be our next, uh, ideally. I think it's an interesting one. So. It's, you know, I mentioned modern water polo, how fast the ball is going. When I'll, I'll crunch some numbers, and you basically have, for vast majority of the shots in water polo, men's or women's, you have half the time that it takes you to blink. Okay? Blink. Just blink with your eyes. You have about that time or less to, to basically perform several complex movements and get to the ball. Yeah. And it seems bloody hell. That's, that sounds impossible when you only, I mean, the, the, the regular human reaction to visual stimulus is about 200 to 100, 250 milliseconds. Okay. No matter who you are, it, it does not improve. It's just, uh, my son has exactly the same one as you or me. We're about, I don't know, 40 milliseconds apart. Yeah. So it's an eight. But, and then you think, my God, how the hell do they get to the ball in, in that minute time and get there comfortably? Well, it's not because they guess, but it's because they anticipate. We re- it's basically pattern recognition. Yeah. And, and, and anticipation here is really, and, and I, I have to be really, really careful here. 
to, I actually wrote this down, um, to not, when, when you say this to kids, okay, to, uh, you know, we suggest not just to watch the ball, but, you know, have a, have a think about where do you think, given the situation, you know, what, what is, what's the shooter going to do, where they're going to shoot, okay? The danger here is for them to start guessing and then they might get one great double-handed save and four, four times the ball go past and they jump, jump in the wrong direction, okay? That's guessing, okay? Anticipation is something completely different, okay? Anticipation actually happens at subconscious speed, okay? You actually don't think about anticipation. You just know, okay? If you're thinking about it, it's probably guessing, yeah? And when you guess, you're, you're either too late or too, too early or you look stupid and all that, but anticipation is something completely different. And it comes from literally thinking about it before and all that, um, and, and, and try to notice patterns. And then when it happens, your body, it is amazing to what happens to your body uh, when it becomes, um, when your actions are seared into that small brain, the cerebellum, okay? That's what enables us to get, get to the ball. And they did this phenomenal study. Um, I mentioned the book, uh, the guy called Benjamin Libet. He's actually worked out he trained people. Um, he did this study when the people had to just flick their wrist voluntarily and he recorded their brain patterns. The, their brain started firing 200 milliseconds before they even started thinking about it and making a move. Okay? Because it was because that seed in the small brain. Yeah? So, you know there's a chance for goalkeepers, but you have to actually consciously think about it, practice it, so it becomes that kind of second nature. You're not even aware of it. I couldn't explain it to you. I couldn't talk you through a jump on mine because I've done two million of them and I know exactly where TV shoots. Okay, so he's got one option here, one option there. Which one's going to go for? Okay, in the end, I'm deciding between two options. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah rather than picking up all the noise and all the signals and then just kind of making a wild guess and just throwing myself, okay, I might look good, I might look stupid, I don't care, okay? So that's, that's um, that kind of progression from, from um, and, I, and I talk about it a bit later as well, that sort of the competence model. You go from, from unconscious incompetence you don't even know what you're doing when what you're doing wrong. Okay. Is that, is that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the kids joining in. <laughs> nice. Um, you got this unconscious, um, what's it? Unconscious incompetence. You, you don't even know you're incompetent at it. Like, and there's some people sometimes, kids especially if you do something they kind of dismiss it oh leave me alone and all that okay and then you have conscious incompetence when you go okay i know i'm incompetent but i'm giving it a go okay so that's where mistakes are really 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 important and not to be frowned upon make mistakes mistakes are just feedback that's fine you know but keep doing the right thing because in the long run when you become competent when you see those movements in your small brain you will be picking them like apples okay so um okay and then the next stage goes to conscious competence where where you're actually aware you're doing something well but it just takes you a lot of kind of time and thinking and you still make a lot of mistakes but you're getting better and you start to eliminate mistakes and then that kind of at the elite level what you know pro national league sort of level um, you get the, you're so competent, you don't even know you're competent. You don't even know what you're doing because you're just doing it. Yeah. And it's same as driving the car. You know, you start the car, you know, the first you, you jerk, you don't know where the stick shift is and that sort of thing. You struggle and eventually you drive the same route to work. You, you, you know exactly what's going to happen on a certain day. You are almost just looking for it. And that, that's what anticipation means. 
it's in, in, in the book, I kind of described the analogy. So it feels like you've read the book, you've just come to the game and watched the movie of it, movie version of it, and you're just looking for differences. You know exactly what's going to happen, and you just go, okay, well, if there's any difference, I know that, and you know what to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. Marco? Yeah. I have a question. Um, so, obviously, anticipation is in very close relationship with positioning in yeah, golf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, my question is related to your book. Is there, like, I'm a goalkeeper, and like I like to think that I know where to go and how to position myself. But as a coach, I don't know how to explain to other um, what's the right way. And is there like a, some kind of manual that's gonna um, that's gonna show all the options based on positioning what we can anticipate? It's easy to say if you come out of the goals, you can anticipate a, a lob shot, of course. Yeah, you know? yeah. Is there like mm -hmm. a manual that like? As a, from the coaching port, so if all those people are not coaches, what can they give advice, and me as well, what can I give advice to a future goalkeepers, um, mm. how, how to go with positioning and anticipating, because they're really close, and we, you can't separate them. Yeah, yeah. Separate them. Yeah, well, first of all, in, in that regard, the first I would do is, is always to the kids and might actually get onto the next question as well is it, about focusing and watching the ball is watch the ball just respond to the ball okay especially when they're young um you, you kind of reduce the options because if you start you reduce the options to one just watch the damn thing and watch it fly and that's fine that's all you got to worry about because if you if you start introducing these things with very young kids they start focusing you know uh, I've heard and I cringe at coaches going, oh, look, we're talking like 12, 13 year olds, goalkeepers. They're going, oh, look how their hips are positioned. They're going to move that way. You know, like, oh, my God. I'm kind of going, oh. I didn't want to say anything. So uh, it wasn't my session. So I stayed out of it. But I'm going, you're just confusing the kid. Just get them to watch the ball first, be comfortable with that. And then over time, so, and, and then ask the kid, what have you noticed? Yeah, rather than actually telling them, ask them, what have you noticed? Okay, give them a task to actually, okay, other than just watching the ball, what do you notice? And then, because then it's, it's, it's there, and, and that serves two purposes. You, you see where, where they're at, okay, um, in terms of noticing a pattern and anticipation, and that's, are they able to, are they, you know, and, and secondly, it's, it's their solution, yeah? It's their way of doing it, they own it. Rather than you telling them something that you're not exactly sure whether they're gonna get it. You, you, can, you can go sometimes blue in the face, you can, you can have the best explanation in the world, but if the, if the kid doesn't really kind of get it or own it, it's not the best explanation in the world then. Yeah. So watch the ball and then as they get a little bit comfortable, just ask them, what have you noticed about that guy, how he shoots? Yeah, he's oh he's always going to the right. Oh, okay, oh interesting. Yeah, I noticed that too. So you reckon, yeah, no. It's, what would be as a goalkeeper, what, do you reckon you you know give them the option to then they go, you know, make them feel that it's their idea, but it's basically your idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's an old trick, yeah, but it works because they then own it. Yeah. So when do you actually think we should start um, um, introducing? Well, at what age you should we should start introducing positioning, and anticipating the ball? Good question. I think watching the ball can start anytime, anytime. I mean, that's number one. Really, they can start better than nine or when they first come to goalkeeping. That's easy. And then you see them. Um, some kids will actually be, um, they will try it. They will start, you have the old guesser. They will just go two hands. You know, they will just go and jump two hands. I'm sure you've seen those. <laughs> and then you go, well, you know. Um, and really depends on the kid. Um, some a little bit faster than that. 
some kids will find out within weeks that you you'll see them you'll see the brain going oh hang on and some kids will would not even occur to them yeah so you have to it really really depends on the kids to when when you start sorry i don't have a definite answer on that but you just have to kind of read the play and you'll see when the kid is ready okay when the other starts to have a little bit of success because if they have success they want more of it yeah, does that make sense because if they start um if they start noticing and, and, and noticing when the shooter is going to, I don't know, lobs are usually a really good indication, you know, that oh, uh, 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 is a lob coming and they start catching the lobs. Okay, well, okay. What else can you, you anticipated that one, or what else can you anticipate? Yeah. But again, you invite them rather than you telling them. Yeah. I'm not saying sometimes, of course, you have to tell them, but make it in a way that what you want to tell them comes from them, not from you. It's a, it's a long way around <laughs> sometimes it takes the longer but when it when it drops it is it's theirs they own it and it's and it's you know a lot more powerful than you you telling them it's not to stop you from telling them absolutely not yeah yeah but they need to own it yeah again that's a really long long-winded answer to your simple question <laughs> As you can tell, I can put goalies all night. Yes. <laughs> all right, Tibby, you pick a question. <clears throat> interesting to anyone else? Yeah. Interesting to see how um, you know talking about the experience and learning it, and you know reading it, and. Um, some of the all the goalies who who are still playing and not necessarily physically they're good anymore how how well they can perform because all that experience and how they read it and they figure out the players and they know what's coming automatically mm. Um, mm. i'll, I'll mm. love uh, sometimes watching them when i played and i we had some older goalies at times it was almost like it could be a blinder an absolute blind uh, from him or whoever was in the goal, but we also knew that the physical abilities can uh, can sort of get the better of better of him. And, That's uh, a very nice way of putting it, TV. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> the mind still so, knows what to do, but, but the body's you know not I mean. going to so, let it. <laughs> Sadly, I, think, I do. Yeah, I really think that for goalies, um, and please. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on this, but I really think that obviously goalies. I think the more mature they are, the better, um, to a degree, of course. Uh, but interestingly, they starting that experience as you described when they're young. They're learning themselves, and and the coach is leading them, not just telling them, but actually they experience things, and it never stops. It only stops once they can't yeah. do. What what's actually in there because the physical abilities yeah. are not yeah. backing it up, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it how you yeah. sort of see it? Yeah, then, 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 yeah, and, and then we start to compensate, yeah, <laughs> um, by trash talking and things like that, yeah. <laughs> no, but really, uh, I really you point out a really good point there, um, and it's that kind of difference between. Uh, experience and expertise okay experience is not a it's a good um ground for expertise to emerge but it does not necessarily guarantee expertise experience is the time you played something and expertise is the standard you're playing at okay and sometimes we kind of confuse the two uh, they kind of get thrown in the same basket. Oh, he's experienced goalie. That means that he's an expert. Not necessarily so. Okay. You could have, you could, and, and it, again, depends on the context, you know, it's, yeah, um, uh, you know, you might have in your under 16 team, you might have an expert goalie who's been a goalie for two years and someone who's just jumped in and you call the, the kid who's played for two years an expert compared to the other kid. Um, but, but it's really, um, hopefully, what we try to get the goal is to work towards 
is not just experience, but actually that developing that expertise. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what needs to be, that's what needs to be pushed, the, the quality, not just the quantity. Okay, for them to actually think about, for not just to be told and spoon fed, but actually then think about it and, and process it and think it and stuff it up and learn from it, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, this is the process. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure she won't mind mentioning, but Gigi would know um, Lil Hedges is currently going through. Yeah? And it's amazing how she's all of a sudden from this kind of happy go lucky goalkeeper who was just kind of okay. It was experienced, but all of a sudden she, you know, she knows stuff. Yeah, would I be right, Gigi? She there? Hello? She's gone to sleep. Let me check. Georgina, unmute. There you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Me on the video at all? Oh, I you want the uh, video now too? Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. I was uh, nod nodding my head. Yep. Uh huh. Or oh, nodding asleep, is it? Yeah. <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> no, but She's seriously, you know, but but you but you little coach, okay? She she's at the cusp, progressing from just experience to expertise now. I think you gotta understand uh, that you are uh, progressing from experience to expertise, <laughs> and then you can say uh, you are on that way. Mm. If you know what I mean, you gotta. Mm know about yourself and uh, actually proactively uh, progress it mm. and be hungry for it. Uh, mm. So I think she's on the way. Uh, the more yeah. uh, hits she gets, the more she's pushed on the way to, to think mm. about how to bring that forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, th and this, we're not, you know, this is a stuff that happens, not just at the late level. It happens, God, it happens in under 14s. The test of expertise is it's, it's a drug. Yeah, you get you you get a, you get a kick out of being able to do something you previously weren't able to do. Um, I mean, after all, that's that's what keeps goalies coming back for more and more. I mean, all field players for that matter, really. But we really, but that doesn't just happen. We have to kind of make that happen, give you opportunities for that. And when it happens, we acknowledge it. We don't have to make a big song and dance about it, but acknowledge it, you know, and maybe tell the goalkeepers or ask them, you know, how do they feel about it? I mean, did you think, you know, played a good game? And if they played a good game, you know, well done. You know, just, what did you learn? Just yeah. a question on that, Thomas, uh, actually. Sure. Uh, I think with expertise and uh, the level of expert uh, either you're aiming for or you're getting to, I don't know, it's your views and goalies' views that brings the psychology in as well. And uh, mm. I tend to see um, maybe female goalies are different to male, is that overthinking, overanalyzing comes in because you know more. You know more. Yeah, uh, that's the danger. You anticipate more. And the yeah. psychology can be detrimental uh, to then your yeah. performance. So yeah. I'm interested yeah. in your thoughts. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's that kind of, it, it breeds that kind of um, perfectionist mindset, which there's nothing wrong being perfectionist. Does it? The goalkeeper, you almost have to perfect the perfectionist because you have such a responsible role. Yeah, um, you screw up, it's a goal. You, you almost, but I don't want to have in a goal in the goals. I don't want to have someone who just goes, "Oh well, you know, just yeah, well, you know, someone else will pick it up." I, I don't. I want someone who is, you know, a, a closet perfectionist. But but there's a danger of, as you rightly pointed out over analyzing, overthinking, over complicating, over, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. Um, um, I don't know if it's a, I mean, I've coached both male and female teams. I do tend to agree it's a more of a um, women's water polo team. Um, but, but once they get it, once it's explained, once, under, once it's understood, girls tend to be actually better than boys. 
they take it more seriously than, than, than the boys. The boys, the boys are just another, uh -huh, not on the head, let's go. And the, the girls take a bit longer to process, but once they, you know, get something clear in their head, then, 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 then they fly, yeah. Um, as for, as for overanalyzing and crit and, 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 um, and overthinking things, um, one way out of it, um, not necessarily out of it, but through it, really, and to get it to work to your benefit, is by establishing routines, like a set routine. You know, if if I'm having these thoughts, what's my routine? And you you know you fall fall in that cat. That, that's your fault, but you find yourself thinking, I don't know, overcomplicating, okay? I'm overcomplicating, what's my next step? So you actually have a strategy out, you don't just hope, or oh, maybe I'll stop thinking like that, yeah? Um, um, really interesting conversation I had with the handball coach from Slovenia. Um, he had, it's, it's really similar to kind of, I have this kind of learn, prepare, act, sort of stages he has set focus react to his goalkeepers and he says that could be for the game for attack for the season it's set focus react set focus react set this is where you do the thinking focus down to one or two options and then react you don't even think about it you just go okay and that was for, for his goalkeepers that's his routine And this kind of, it's, it's, he's, he says he's he now little kids, you can set, focus, react, set, focus, react, set, focus, react. Yeah. And seems to be working really well for them. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, adjusted for your context. And, you know, it is easily said and done, of course. <laughs> so I think we all know um, there is a, Fair bit of pressure, uh, mm. mental demand on the goalkeeping. So, I'd like to jump to to Q7. What are the mental demands of goalkeeping? If we can, uh, Thomas, if yeah. you want to elaborate on that, and yeah. please be active and ask questions if you have any. Um, it's um, it's. The people, you know, they actually write in the book. I keep coming back to it, but sorry, I can't help myself because I'm, I'm fresh from from the experience. Um, people ask, you know, what's it like being a goalie? And and to to football people, you go, okay, well, imagine you being the penalty shooter of the last penalty, and if you you know if you don't win it, if you don't if you screw up, basically your team's lost. Okay. Well, that's goalie for the whole game. Every attack is like that. And they go, oh, okay. Well, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so reconciling with that, with responsibility, you know, um, one thing. Another thing is the mistakes will happen. You will have a bad game. You will. There has never been a goalkeeper in any sport, in any nation, in anything that hasn't lost the game for, I mean, not lost the game for, but hasn't made this crucial mistake that kind of cost the team a goal and all the rest of it. Yeah, never been one, never will be one. Okay, so it will happen. It's what you do after that matters. I mean, God, it's, you know, I'm sure there's, uh, every coach that listened to this would, would be nodding to this. You know, so I'm not telling some sort of, you know, great, great secrets here, but but to acknowledge that with the goalkeepers and telling him straight up that that's going to happen, um, I think sometimes it frees them up, um, gives them that little bit of space. Nobody's going to do it deliberately. Trust me on that one. <laughs> Nobody will let a stupid goal through deliberately. Nobody ever. I mean, you... You could be angry with your goalkeeper. I assure you they didn't do it deliberately. If they did it deliberately, kick him off the team and never to return. You know? That's what I would do, yeah. <laughs> um, Bruce Grobola. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't he say Liverpool in those penalties? Yeah. <laughs> but um, 
but one thing is having that um, it's really naive to expect everything to go your way it's a really childish way of the, of seeing the world basically that you think that everything's going to you're going to have every game's going to be great that you're going to make all the saves that you're never going to make a mistake and all that and god it just just you know it, it's 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 a it's a toddler's view of the world really so it's okay it's what happens um first of all how we're going to make sure that doesn't happen and secondly um that you, you know thing you may have to pick it up and you have to save the next one and you know tough it out for the rest of the tournament because we only have one goalkeeper or whatever whatever the case might be okay you have to get through it not around it not over it but through it mm. yeah um so and it's important especially if it becomes really acute mm. goalkeepers i mean a serious topic here but golf Goalkeepers are known to mental health issues, uh, depression. I mean, there's well publicized, like suicides of you know football goalkeepers um, around the world. You got Jesus Rolian, there you go, mm -hmm. from our own sport. Um, and because you know, th this is the dark side of that identity of the goalkeeper that I was talking about before. You know, you identify, you, you think then you're less worth as a person if you're less worth as a goalkeeper. That's the dark side of it. That's the, that, that's, that's the trade-off, okay? And you have to really be careful to untangle that from the person, that you're still a perfectly good, acceptable person, mm -hmm. okay? If you let that go through, that cost, whatever, whatever, okay? It's mm -hmm. fine, okay? Mm -hmm. we, you're still a person, you're still, you know. Um, and, and on that, actually, um, this is um, um, a little actually personal story. I could so relate to um, our son. Um, he was playing last year. They were playing this tournament down in Bunbury, soccer tournament. They were playing these art troubles. And, and it was 1-0, um, tight game. And goal... Yeah, maybe he could have done a little bit better, but so could have defence. But, you know, one of those, yeah, a bit of kind of just went the wrong. And we're talking under 11s, for God's sake, yeah. And the poor thing was in tears after the game, you know, which I was kind of, part of me was glad because he cared about it. But part of me was going, okay, so we just kind of talked through. And he, and he, and he had that classic goalie's blame. Is because goalkeeper's mistake is easier to see, um, Everyone goes, whether explicitly or implicitly, will go, aha, uh -huh, that's what lost the game. No. And it's like, it's like, you know, it's like watching the crowds of football. When a striker misses a shot, the crowd goes, ooh. And when the goalie stops it up, the crowd goes, ah. But the result is exactly the same. Mm. Yeah. So that's the, you know, to, to see the context in which the whole thing happened mm. and to, um, well, of course, nobody wants to make mistakes, but mistakes like that will happen. Yeah? Um, and for them to be okay with it. Yeah? Check out in the book that story of Brazilian goalkeeper, poor bastard. He was the, um, he was the goalkeeper of the tournament. This is 1950 World Cup Brazil. Goalkeeper of the tournament. Last game, played well, um, 11 minutes to go, um, you know, 200,000 uh, Brazilians at newly built Maracanã Stadium Rio with about to be crowned world champions, that sort of thing. And the guy at a winger kind of, he was going to center the ball, mishit it, somehow dribble through the near post. Um, cut the story short, he says his famous sentence, he says in Brazil, he says the maximum sentence is 30 years for murder. He says, I've got 50 years. Um, because the whole nation blamed him for 50 years for kind of losing that game. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's heartbreaking. <laughs> mm. 
Mm-hmm. And way beyond the scale we're talking about here. But, but, that's, but that's the goalkeeper's lot and help them get through it. Yeah. Don't just abandon them. Yeah. Plus, isn't it, isn't it true that uh, you, you know, as a field player, you, you get off every now and then and you get a bit of a break and you get back into it. You don't have, need to focus for four quarters. Uh, but as a goalie, you don't often have the, the second goalie coming in. You don't always just change in and out. Um, no, no. It's, it's not a no. it's not a general thing that uh, coaches would do with goalies. So that no. immense pressure, um, you need to be sometimes, in a good sense, I'd say, a little bit crazy, a little bit genius to to have that focus and to be that precise and be able to cope with that pressure. This is just a yeah. field play mm. of view, and and, and I've seen goalies getting goals. Mm-hmm. from halfway in the last few seconds uh, in mm-hmm. big international games and uh, unfortunately mm-hmm. some of them break completely and their career mm-hmm. goes downhill because they just can't take it um, mm-hmm. which is sad but that's that's a tough gig mm-hmm. um, yeah um, on that oh, just, I was going to say something but yeah, never mind. Sorry, I'll stop, I'll stop you. No, 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 no. All good, all good, TV. All good. For us coaches, uh, Thomas, would you have uh, some advice for us coaches uh, about the changing, substituting the goalkeepers and uh, especially with the new rules? Ah, okay. Well, it, one, it's, 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 it's still a different, it's still a different thing, isn't it? When you change a goalkeeper and a field player, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yes, um, big time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so much is read into it, and oh, you got. See, the goalie doesn't get stopped. The goalie gets dragged. Even the use of language, yeah. The goalie gets dragged out, like, <laughs> like some sort of re- <laughs> reject. <laughs> Please note my language substitutioning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dragged. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's never, uh, never nice. Uh, it's it's a lot bigger deal than the field players, a lot bigger deal because of that frequency of, of that change. I mean, you really have to screw it up um, for you to be dragged as a goalkeeper, of course, unless it's kind of predetermined who's going to play two quarters and whatnot. Um, I think, I think, especially in the modern game. I think it's a matter of planning, especially because it gives you the new rules that do give you the flexibility. For example, you have um, the option, I don't know, one goalkeeper might be a, if you're playing with two, um, might be a better shooter or, or, or might be better uh, or, you know, I don't know. It's easy to say, of course, for the goalkeepers to get over the... Um, to get over the, the quick changes. I think I'd like to see it go more of the, with the way of handball, where they change goalies a lot more frequently. And you'd have goalkeepers, for example, you have a specialist for penalties, and maybe they're not even specialist, but it's just a different set of legs and different colors for the shooters to look at, yeah? So use it as a kind of tactical advantage rather than, than kind of a personal attack on the goalkeeper and all that. But that's a matter of plan, yeah. Um, and if it's in the service of the team, that they do it. If they understand it, it's in the service of the team. That's fine. Yeah. I've, I've heard a story of a fantastic story of a Croatian goalkeeper. He's, he's um, experienced in goalkeeper. They were playing national league game, and he is a captain of a team. He actually subbed himself out because I'm playing shit. He said, "I'm playing shit today. It's not my day. Young one, get in. You'll play better." Yeah, I mean, rare cases. At you know, on on the surface of it, you think, oh my God, what a loser! But no, he's you know he, he did it for the team. So you, and this comes back to the identity of the goalkeeper right at the start. We're talking about you are, you may be special. No, what is this? But you're not special. You're different, but you're always in the service of the team. Yeah. So if the team needs you to be dragged or, you know, substitute it or, or for whatever reason, then that's, that's what you have to accept. And if you're a good leader of a team, then, you know, then that's fine. 
I don't know. Maybe I'm talking idealistically. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. In uh, prompted prom prompted more in me, but uh, <laughs> answered it in the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, one question that always pops up is, and it's actually uh, I've wrote it down. I think it's question eleven. How much do you need to know about goalkeeper to work with goalkeepers? Okay. This is the classic kind of reluctance of people who are not big goalkeepers to, um, to say, oh, I don't know anything about goalkeeper. I don't know enough about goalkeeping to work with goalkeepers. Okay. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing that you know. It's, it's definitely an advantage if you know a little bit about goalkeeping, working with goalkeepers. Of course, you can relate to a little bit better. You can, you know, they can probably see it. Yeah, absolutely. The danger, the biggest danger I've seen, and I, I'm the first one to put my hand up, but so totally guilty of, especially my younger days, is to try to make them like me. So they don't see the individual in front of them, just want to, they want to clone themselves. Yeah. Hey, it worked for me, so therefore it worked for you. And the kid could be completely different, you know, type of goalkeeper, completely. As for a completely different person, which they are anyway. Um, so that's the danger. Um, and it's something I wrote in a book, actually, I remember now that I wrote it down, is your own goalkeeping experience, if you're a goalkeeper, is a great tool for reflection. For you to see, aha, uh -huh, oh, this is different to me, and how what, what could I learn from what I've done to you know to help, and what's different to my experience, that sort of thing. But not as validation, okay. As I said, not to make a clone of it and then compare that young goalkeeper to to younger you or or, or someone else, okay. But what I would say to the people who are non-goalkeepers working with goalkeepers, everything you do will be appreciated. Okay? As long as you, as long as you, they see you as someone who comes in with good intentions and a humility that, well, shit, sometimes I don't know, sometimes you know, level with them, well, ask them for goodness sake. Yeah? Um, I really have a problem with this idea that um, especially at high levels, especially at high levels, not, not juniors, juniors are a different thing, but you know, at, at National League, to, for all the players to be told what they should do all the time, oh, Jesus, sunshine, you play this damn thing 10, 15 years by then time, okay? Take some responsibility, okay? What do you think? Okay. What, what exercises do you know are good for your, what you need? Okay. Okay. Well, let's have a look and let's, let's toss those around. Yeah? So you give them, you actually empower them to actually come up with their own solution. It's not to say you just leave into your own devices, but you actually give them, given the, the power, but with the responsibility for their own development. And then what they commit to, you, you keep them accountable to it. Hey, sunshine, you've committed to that many sessions in gym. It's going to be this as well. It's not happening. Okay. And that kind of becomes your role as a coach. But, but to come back to it, I really, I, it may, the lack of experience of working with goalkeepers may seem like a big handbrake on working with goalkeepers, but it really need not be, especially in younger categories. If you got the basics of, you might just be a case of pulling them aside a little bit, give them a little bit of extra some sort of goalkeeper looking game to look at, focus on the ball, keep it really simple and they will appreciate it. Okay. You don't have to be the world's greatest wizard and whatnot. Okay. But having said that, what does help and it's something I'm, I'm really kind of, this is another conversation with Stan, to understand some of the kind of just kind of the basic principles of, you know, we talked about central gravity and, 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 positioning and movement yeah thanks paulie um uh to understand those and there's a lot of smart people who are coaches who will 
once they understand those basics, they will be able to adjust and you know things like that. But if you if you come up cold, well then it's then it is really difficult. And I can see how people can be apprehensive working with goalkeepers because they kind of don't want to do the wrong thing. But doing nothing is almost the worst thing you can possibly do. Does that make sense? Yes, it's really good. Yeah. I think um, in in many instances, especially with club club coaching, you mm. you do not have enough uh, people who work with the goalies, and I I really believe that there there must be always a goalkeeper around who who will chip in, who, who will help, mm. or someone who you can talk to mm. as of mm. how we how we teach the kids. So yes, mm. obviously we all have some ideas uh, as coaches, mm. but um, me where I grew up I, I noticed that especially at the time there wasn't enough focus on the goalies now on a higher level it's getting way much better well it has been much better the last sort of mm. 10, 15 years um, since I've been here but um, still on club level just with juniors we we don't mm. always have uh, that coaching expertise uh, input whether that's you, you know, know it doesn't have to be the goalie who's coaching the goalie absolutely behind it. Thank you, Tibi, for saying that because, you know, we don't have to look around the club. Oh, who's a goalkeeper in a club who wants to go, look, go, uh, work with goalkeepers? No. Who wants to work with goalkeepers? Lose the goalkeeper bit. Yeah? Be give me a person who's keen to learn, who understands the basics, that sort of thing to work, not having been the goalkeeper. Give me that person of uh, some sort of old, crusted goalkeeper who will tell the kids what they used to do 30 years ago. Give me, give me that first person over that second one any time, any time. Yeah? So we kind of do goalkeepers disservice when we start looking for goalkeepers around the world, uh, around the club. Just anyone who wants to work. It's, 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 it's kind of a little team within the team. And, it, you know, again, make it attractive. I mean, yeah, you don't have you know, one of the appeals is you're not going to have to work with 20 kids, you'll just have to be two, and they'll listen to every word you say. <laughs> two is easy to manage. But well, one of the things I was going to say, they're looking at just Marco, and I know his passion, and I also know that um, how much he's when he's coaching, he's not coaching goalies necessarily. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, Marco, but you're coaching and you're coaching field players and it always comes down to coaching the team. You do a little bit for the goalie, but ideally you could be utilised very well uh, to do more goalie stuff. Uh, time is always a, a, uh, you know, another factor, but um, you don't have the opportunity. It's, uh, there is one thing, like I was lucky enough to all my life have a goalkeeper since the age of seven and eight. I, mm -hmm. I had a goalkeeper, in part, a goalkeeper coach in Partizan and uh, after that goalkeeper coach in Red Star and Partizan again and Red Star. So I always had a goalkeeper and uh, the, as a matter of fact, all those goalkeeper coaches were some kind of goalkeepers. And mm -hmm. all my life I've been experienced uh, uh, someone like coaching by someone telling me what they used to be, what they used to do. And me yeah. as a kid, me as a kid, I didn't understand that quite well back then. Yeah. I was a kid, so I was Spot listening. On. But then on. I, I, as I was growing up, I realized that they were not actually good. They became coaches because they've been crappy goalkeepers and they left their goalkeeping careers. And now they're goalkeepers in partisan and, and you're, you know, they, they're still learning as well. So yeah. I always like, I never liked that, you know, like, as, as well, I, I don't like that uh, I'm a goalkeeper, I should go, go goalkeepers. Having said that, I did learn a really valid lesson that uh, I'm one, 187 tall and I'm never going to have the same technique and I can't teach goalie out of two meters how to goalkeep the same way I used to do. So yeah, yeah. I did get a valuable experience to, to know that um, I can teach everyone like the way I'm doing it. And yeah, very I, important. The, the, my biggest problem, TB, is that I'm still heavily involved in, in playing. So I can't mm. help and I can't resist that feeling to tell people what it suits me as a goalkeeper at the moment because I'm still mm. experiencing. So until mm. I grew out of that level that I'm like, I'm mm. not a goalkeeper in, in, in the pool anymore, and now I'm the goalkeeper or a coach next to the pool and just next to the pool, 
I can't take the responsibility of, you know, putting some work. Yeah. Yes. As I, mentioned, as I mentioned before, being a role model, jumping in a pool, having fun, saving balls, introducing yeah, it. Yeah, that's people, different. Yeah. That's yeah. Yes. But me as taking responsibility, coaching someone what they should do, like, because I'm doing it, I'm still not there and I, I'm not ready to uh, take that, you know, step and take that responsibility to do that. That's why I'm avoiding it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, like, what, what Marco was saying is it's really, um, I'm really glad you pointed it out um, about, you know, old goalkeepers. Uh, but especially perhaps unique in Australia, maybe around the world as well. But I'll never forget, we had this a couple of years ago, Gig, you were there um, in Canberra when I said, so you want to be a goalkeeper in Australia? One of the things you have to be good at is becoming your own coach, okay? So put it straight out there to the goalkeepers, okay? There's a good chance you will not have a specialist goalkeeper, coach, okay? But be, for all sorts of reasons. So therefore, what are you going to do about it, okay? Well, a very good option is you actually, you become your own coach. You actually, you invest that in learn and, you know, could, could be a real strength. I'm not saying it's an ideal position, but it's something that you just deal with. And, you know, and goalkeepers tend to be quite good learners and analyzers and all that of, of the things because of all the, a lot of the things that we talked about tonight, because, you know, they have to get it right and they have to be perfect. So they actually invest a little bit more energy into it. Um, I'm not saying all of them and I'm not saying, um, you know, more than any field players and all that, I'm not, but it's, it's an option, you know, but we need to not shy away from it, but actually I'd say we talk about it, you know, just bring it out. Okay. Well, you know, talk with the kids if, or, or, or juniors or, or seniors. Look, I'm a sole coach. There's 18 of you here in the pool deck. I'm going to be mostly working with field players. I would love to work with your goalkeepers. Hey, I was, I was exactly the same. My heart was breaking. I couldn't work with my goalkeepers, my beloved goalkeepers, because I have, you know, I, have, I had 20 field players to look after. But then I would go to goalkeepers and say, okay, we planned the session. They even helped me plan the session. And then they banged it out. And I would just check on them. Yeah. So it, it is possible. It's possible. Yeah.